your podcast from the Port Moody Public Libraries for book lovers by book lovers. I am your host today, Kareen, and I am joined by my book friends, Gabriel, Virginia, and Fiona. If you're listening to this as a podcast, they are waving. I swear to goodness, they are waving and making direct eye contact with you. Uh, Today's episode is very, very special. Today is our 100th as far as we know, keep it fictional episode, which means that we can officially be put into syndication on United States television. (laughs) Finally, I know we are all hoping to meet that threshold and we have. Um, In honor of our 100th episode, I did a little bit of research into the number 100, which as Wikipedia defines it, it can also... (laughs) be called the Roman numeral C, and it is a natural number following 99 and preceding 101. So if you were worried and you weren't quite sure what this 100 was all about, I think Wikipedia lays it out very well for you. Um, We are recording this 100th episode on August 19th, which is the Saint Day of Saint Bertolt of Bobbio which has no relevance to this podcast whatsoever. I just write, <laughs> really like saying the word Bobbio. I'm sure he died a very tragic death. And speaking of deaths, this is also the day that the Roman Emperor Augustus bit the dust. I know that Virginia is probably still mourning this. Um, as a classics person, I'm sure you're feeling today deeply, which is why everyone here except for me is wearing black. Uh, 100 is also the boiling temperature of pure water. Now you know. Um, It's also the atomic number of fermium, which is apparently some sort of metal. I didn't do that much research. I was just like, okay, 100 page, scroll, 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 scroll. Um, And did you know that in Greece, India, Israel, and Nepal, to dial 100 on your phone is to actually call the police? And if you are in Belgium and you are in dire need of ambulance assistance or something is on fire... You do not dial 911, you dial 100. See, this podcast is educational. This podcast is entertainment. What more do you want from a centenarian? Which is what this podcast is. We're old, we're rickety, and we're waiting for our letter from the queen. So, For this very special episode, we came up with a very special challenge, I think is the word that I want to go with. Um, And we decided to do a little bit of a secret Santa. So all of our readers, including Mark, who unfortunately cannot be here today, chose two books that kind of represent them as readers. Either they are books that they have read before or books that they haven't. I know Gabriel definitely hadn't read them before because they cheated and they chose two books that they wanted to read um, because we did a little secret Santa. No, they didn't. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, controversy erupts. Controversy erupts. I remember in the email chain, there was something about this, but anyways, we chose our two books. We put them in a literal cauldron and then each of us chose two books from our fellow readers or maybe even from ourselves. And of those two books, we chose one that we had to read for this podcast to share. So it's the fun of kind of a Russian roulette of reading, if you will, Um, but also the fun of a guessing game, which of course I love and I'm not at all competitive about. So um, from my book friends, I am curious to know when they kind of start their books, which two books they chose, well, were chosen for them by the hand of fate, Um, which one they chose and why, a little bit about the book and then who they think this book is from. And I'm actually going to start with Gabriel because I think Gabriel has figured out who their two books were from. You have thrown a little bit of a wrench into my plans because I don't remember the title of the second book I was given because immediately I saw one of them and knew which one I was going to read. And so there was very little attention given to the other one. And also in my defense, I think someone had um, initially 
uh, put it on hold or something. And so then there was some swapping around of my second book option. Basically, it didn't really matter because my heart was already betrothed to the first option. And so I wasn't going to worry like too much about it. So the second one, I believe might have been some kind of YA murder mystery mixed with social issues, which does sound fun. But with the other option, oh, okay, Virginia's saying it might have been Good Girl's Guide to Murder, and that sounds like what it was, and so I'm going to assume that was my other option. But out of the two I was given, I chose the more lighthearted book, um, which is pretty funny, considering that the book that I chose is called your guide to not getting murdered in a quaint english village by maureen johnson and illustrated by jay cooper i do have to assume this was kareen's book solely based on the concept uh so it's kind of i would call it a satire of the cozy mystery genre and specifically the setting of the tiny village in the english countryside that we all know and love we'd love to go there we'd love to see it we'd love to reconsider all of our life's uh, choices up until that point when maybe we are um, seeing a panel of uh, people dressed in strange costumes and they're dragging us away and we're maybe like fearing for our life but then you know maybe there's someone maybe a youth from like the town that um, doesn't really agree with what's been happening and they think that you could have like the secret to kind of like unlocking it maybe they need to get away maybe they don't have their driver's license yet but that's unlikely because all rural people can drive even if they don't have their license all rural people can drive so i do think this teenager could probably leave without you but they might be considering using you for testimony purposes or they're a honeypot and they were going to kill you too either way so we in in this book it kind of provides a tour of all of the local hotspots. It's a veritable gold mine of clue-style locations to be murdered in, activities and excursions you could do to be murdered while doing them, um, locals you might meet who all might finally be the one to do you in. Um, honestly, great inspiration for Dungeons & Dragons, for you DMs out there. This was this is almost something that I would consider to be um, kind of like the genre of almost like fantasy atlases to an extent or like like um, books where you can just kind of take concepts from them, take characters, take places and uh, rework them to be what you need. And so especially if you are doing a um, yeah, like a Dungeons and Dragons thing, maybe you are a fan of the murder mystery um parties which is what my mom threw for me most years for my birthday probably explains a little bit about me um so there's a few different sections um that are prepared to bestow the absolute best advice that one could ask for from a guide uh so in the village you'll find the church mind the belfry uh and the churchyard which is basically where the villagers will throw you after you've passed uh there's also the pub where you'll feel feel eerily watched, um, the village shop and pond, with suspiciously well-fed ducks, uh, the village hall, where you can find, you know, the pitchforks and torches. Uh, you got your inn uh, that's not at all haunted, a uh, fancy antique shop that I repeat is not at all haunted. Um, the police station has one copper who's a little swamped right now with all the murder, uh, and every and uh you know every vat in the village kind of seems to have something in it you know uh beer pickling brine whiskey jam we've got it all definitely nothing else have you ever considered your future as a pickle these are questions you're going to have to kind of ask yourself um which of these would you rather have your body fermented in for a while after it's gone um this isn't, by the way, that's not you consenting to cannibalism. That's just sort of like might, what, what might happen. And you might want to start thinking ahead um, and kind of planning some of your excursions based on it. Uh, there's also some interesting things in the English manner that you should be aware of. Canopy beds, suits of armor that seem to be missing their swords 
old pianos, grandfather clocks, hedge mazes that would put the Minotaur to shame, uh, kitchens with many hazards, and basements that definitely aren't vaults. Uh, did I mention all of the events? Shooting parties? Weekend house parties? Dinner parties? Oh my. What an opportunity to gather everyone who might be trying to kill you into one convenient location. And then maybe you can do a little bit of an Agatha Christie number and turn around and then interrogate them all there. I'm just putting it out there. Yes, there is potential danger at a shooting party, but also what better over dramatic way to just bring everybody together and then say, I know what, what, what you're up to and sort of just interrogate them. Um, each section does also have a quick quiz at the end of it that you can use to kind of check your knowledge. So I'd suggest practicing this a few times before embarking on any like murder pilgrimages as it might save your life. Um, for instance, in the manner quiz, we have question number four. Okay. And potentially might ask one of my book friends to answer this one based on what they think they want. So Reginald, the child, emerges from an 18th century chest in the hall by the study. He offers you his small clammy hand and he wants to show you his mice. Do you, A, take his hand and go with him to look at the mice? B, politely refuse and continue on your way? Or C, shove him forcefully back down into the chest and lock it. Now, as our teen and youth services librarian, Fiona, which of those would you choose? <laughs> You've got me pegged. Absolutely, I'm going with Reginald. I am ready to adopt Reginald. I am ready to name the mice. There is no suspicion here. Children are great. Okay, well, did Fiona choose correctly? I think you'll have to read the book and find out. You can probably make some guesses. Um, their compassion knows no bounds. I probably would have considered, at least considered the, the chest just a little bit. Um, so Maureen Johnson uh, writes the Truly Devious series, which is a young adult cozy mystery, as well as many other series and standalones uh, that seem to follow uh, some of the same trends and same genre. Uh, the humor and narrative voice in it actually remind me a little bit of Lemony Snicket in a series of unfortunate events, which was a great surprise to have because I do love that series. Um, it's a very conversational style of dark humor that kind of combines the tropes of cozy mystery with some light English history and social critique. Um, there are some lovely illustrations that accompany the murder possibilities, all done in a sketchy, cartoony, black, white, and red style, which makes me think of many jokes I've heard over the years involving black, white, and red all over. Uh, and personally, I love seeing what I'd look like being pushed out of the church bell tower. Uh, so the only thing I'd say that maybe is a negative about the book is that it's quite short. You could breeze through it in a few hours and be entertained. But if you're looking for like a deep deconstruction of the genre, this definitely isn't for you. Um, it's, But it is super fun. And I don't think that's really what you're looking for when you're picking up a book like this. And so I wouldn't really count it against that. It's more, it's, it's kind of like a little bit of a coffee table read. Like it's something you have a chuckle at, maybe you get some inspiration from. And then you don't... Uh, you don't necessarily need to sink your teeth in in the same way. So one thing is certain after reading this, go to a city. Because the city is just as dark and dangerous as the countryside. But at least it's honest about it. So I'm looking forward to when they eventually decide they're going to do one of these for London. And every major city. And I will get to see all of the ways that I cannot get murdered in various places around the globe. And if she hasn't started writing these i think she should because she might have a point and if she goes on a book tour to one of these places they might take it out on her so she should probably get them out pretty quick um because i think she's made at least one small english village quite angry for exposing their plans thank you gabriel uh just for all of our listeners never trust a pale pale child plating hide and seek in a manner especially if they're like glistening and damp not a good idea or you could just take them to play in the sun because they're probably really nice and cute and want to be your friend they'll probably melt in the sun so if you take them out of the manor there's no playing that's going to happen fiona they're going to murder you and shove you in the chest you know that right you know that you've got to know that well i can tell um that all 
the rest of you have never watched Midsummer Murders because you would have ultimately known the answer immediately. Um, thank you, Gabriel, for that uh, summation of what I'd say is like a, a, a perfect light read for that that fan of the British cozy, either books or television series, especially if you've ever seen Midsummer Murders. There are so many ways to die in a small village. So many hunks of cheese, bees, um, crossbow, a strange amount of crossbow accidents. Um, and yes, Gabriel, you did guess correctly that, yes, that was one of my books. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let us go over to Fiona, who chose poorly and might not have much longer to be on this podcast due to their bad choices. Fiona, what two books were you given? Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Um, fate smiled down on me and perhaps knew that I would be going soon because I received not one, but two novellas, which made me extremely happy because, as you know, um, print is dead. Joking, print is very great, but so are audiobooks. Um, I received and did not choose Assembly by Natasha Brown. Uh, which I would say is a Virginia book. So I do feel bad that I received this as my as my second choice book because um, I think it's an excellent choice uh, and I wish that someone else had gotten to read it. Uh, but it actually is something that's going to go on my TBR, uh, but was like, oh, wow, this is too heavy for right now. Uh, come of age in a credit crunch? Be civil in a hostile environment? Go to college? Get an education? Start a career? Do all the right, right things? Buy a flat, buy art, buy a sort of happiness, but above all, keep your head down, keep quiet, and keep going. Uh, yeah, just not in that headspace right now, but I know I will be when life is a little bit lighter. Um, the book that I did choose is absolutely, unquestionably a Mark book. It is The Emissary by Toko Tawada, uh, and it is a Japanese book in translation. Ah, um, so this was a very enjoyable read. Thank you to Mark um, for uh, providing this. Um, this book is post-apocalyptic. Now, let me tell you, it is my type of post-apocalyptic because it is so pragmatic and um, I was just sighing with happiness as I read and lightly laughing at all its um, satire. So the book uh, follows Yoshiro, who, fitting for this uh, podcast, is about 100 years old, a charming and lovely um, older gentleman, which uh, I do love a good older character, and icing on the cake. It's about a relationship with uh, with his younger great-grandson. So God, I love those intergenerational relationships. The older, like the bigger age gap, the better. Um, so in this world, uh, in this post-apocalyptic world, uh, Japan is in a state of isolation. Um, Again, with the, the pragmatism, we it seems to be a slow decline um, for society. I can't remember. There may have been nuclear war. It's not that important. The important thing is that it's general degradation of, of um, particularly um, the health uh, of the next generation. So as the generation goes on, as there are more generations, uh, health seems, seems to be declining. So uh, Yoshiro is 100 and he is mobile and strong and energetic. Um, his great-grandson, uh, Mume, is um, bird-like due to his lack of bone density. Um, he needs to be carried by his great-grandfather to go to school. Uh, sometimes he has trouble holding his head up. He needs help drinking water because it's hard to swallow. And he has no teeth because they've all fallen out. So his bread needs to be soaked in milk before he can eat it. Um, all of this... Uh, 
leads to a great deal of anxiety in Yoshiro. He is constantly um, worrying about his great grandson, who is the apple of his eye. But uh, Mume is actually very a very positive young child, despite his defects. Um, and he has this very like rosy look on life. So they're both extremely charming characters. Uh, Yoshiro's um, love for his great grandson is very endearing. And then Mume's general positivity um, was also very endearing. And then to see them play off each other was quite cute. Uh, in my favorite scene, Mume is getting dressed by himself, no help from his great-grandfather, which may be the most difficult task of his day. Um, and he is trying to put his legs into his pant legs. Um, and there's this great deal about how he's thinking about his 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 flesh legs as sort of like flesh trains that go into <laughs> that go into um you know these these pant tunnels. Uh, and he's looking for the flesh train to come out the other side. Uh, and then he's also wondering, he has a moment where he thinks, wait a minute, am I perhaps an octopus? Do I not have two legs but eight? And four of them are tied together to make one lump? Because I'm always feeling like I want to put them out in different directions. And it's so hard for me to get my flesh trains into my pant tunnels. Um, just absolutely delightful reflection. Like, I won't say that I've ever wondered if I was an octopus when I got dressed, but you, you just have those moments where you think of weird things. And I love Yoko Tawada because she decides to write them down. She decides to write them into her books. Um, these little strange moments of self-reflection in a post-apocalyptic world where uh, children have no teeth and need to soak their, their bread in milk. Um, it's one of those things where truth is stranger than fiction, but it's still fiction where you're going, this is absolutely what the apocalypse is going to be like. Um, we're going to be sitting there eating our soaked bread with no teeth and thinking, yeah, you know, life is kind of okay. Um, <laughs> um, the only issue that I had with it is I honestly, I'm not exactly sure that I know what it's about. And there's definitely um, a great deal. Well, I, I mean, I'm not sure if I know um, what the analogy is. So there's definitely a great deal about focus of Yoshiro's worrying um, about the next generation. And I wonder if it's it's drawing attention to to the the sort of big divide that there seems to be between generations. Um, but ultimately, it's very reflective, very pragmatic. Um, uh, about family, uh, about what, who actually is family, um, and uh, how we how we develop and maintain those relationships. Uh, a really a really beautiful and odd book. I definitely re recommend picking it up because it's only like 140 pages, so you can breeze through it and and have some excellent little chuckles. To the emissary by Yoko Tawada. Thank you so much for Mark uh, for, for bringing this to me. I am looking forward to picking up some more of your picks. That really straddled the border between horrifying and hilarious. So thank you, Fiona. I think the word flesh trains is going to haunt me for pretty much the rest of my waking hours. Ah. Yeah, so thank you, Mark, by proxy for that for that. Well, it wouldn't be an episode of Keep It Fictional if we did not have an existential question. And because this is our 100th, 100th is it? episode, um, I decided to make this one extra hard. Uh, we are all librarians. We have all had this question before. And so I am putting you all on the spot to recommend a good book. Do any of you get follow-up questions? No. Someone just wants a good book. What do you recommend? Well, I've already expressed that I'm not going to answer this question because 
that is not how it works. I do believe there is a good book for every single person and you have to find that good book for them and you need to find by asking them some follow-up questions just because I think it's a good book. Clearly, that's not the case for someone else. So I can't, <laughs> definitely cannot answer this question. So I will have lots of follow-up and that is kind of what we do at the desk. When you come up to us, we can't just give you a straight answer. We're going to give you, we're going to ask you a lot of questions to get that, to make sure that it is the perfect book for you because we don't want you to get turned off from reading because we've given you a so-called good book that is just good for me and not for you. So yes, I refuse to answer this question, which is in also very, very in tune with this keep it fictional thing because that's what we know, like to do sometimes, question the question. So Gabriel, Fiona, over to you. So I'm really bad at impromptu um, adult reader's advisory. Uh, YA, like very good at kids, pretty good at, it feels overwhelming with adult. Um, but I do have a system that is not without its flaws. And, and I can't, um, you know, I can't say that uh, it has no follow-up questions, but I do like, sometimes people are not, not really open to follow-up questions. <laughs> so usually if I can pull out just a little bit more information, I either pull out, I pull out can they, do they want sad? Like, can they deal with violence? Do they want it to be funny? If they're not willing to answer either of those, they get the gown. So that is, it's just like, I just want a nice book. I just want a good book. It's for people who just want something pleasant. They get the gown. If they want something like that, but they're open to some like sadness and violence, I send them to Lisa C. Um, if they are not up for violence and they want funniness, I send them to Susan Juby. And that is my, my three, my three-way system. Um, I've never gotten any feedback on that. So who knows if it's successful. Inspirational. Amazing. I... <laughs> I love your I love the three-way system. I think that's pretty funny and perhaps I should devise my own. I've never heard of any of those. Uh so I wouldn't know what I was getting. I agree with Virginia in the sense that if this was an actual <laughs> conversation, I would just ask them a lot of questions. If I'm not allowed to ask them questions, then I will assume that they are asking based on my subjective point of view and I will probably just tell them what I read last and enjoyed, or I would figure out what their favorite movie or TV series is and then try to do some kind, something similar to that and be like, okay, well, if you like that, then you'll probably like this. But again, that would require asking a question. So instead, I would just tell them to read Good Omens because it's my favorite book. Again, because really at this point, it's not like a, <laughs> because there's no objectively perfect book. And so to you want to try to figure out what the person's going to enjoy. And if you can't figure out <laughs> what they can enjoy, the only person I have to rely on in this world is me <laughs> when it comes to my internal workings. So if you're coming up to me and I'm not allowed to ask you anything, you're getting what I like. So it would either be the last book that I thoroughly enjoyed or my favorite book of all time. So right now you're either getting Good Omens or Thrawn. And those are your options. If you don't like, <laughs> if you don't like sci-fi, see, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I will, I will direct you on to the next person who you will stare at and not answer any questions and then just get whatever their pick is. And I might have to do that based on your vibe because again, I can't answer, I can't ask you any questions. So I'd be like, does this look like someone who would enjoy foraging? Or does this look like someone who would enjoy cannibalism? Or does this look like someone who enjoys less violent murders? And then I'd send them on to a book friend. And I, so I'd have to make a very strange, just judgment call based sort of thing. And then eventually they'd have a selection of books from us, uh, potentially tell them to consult the podcast. Um, and then they can pick from a book list or something like that, because yeah, it, you cannot, <laughs> you cannot tell someone what a good book is. 
but that's okay because you will also always get a video game recommendation bonus from Gabriel. So, folks, cover a good video game instead. So, Corinne, I'm waiting for my, I'm waiting for my quiet, interesting old man to come up and ask me so that I can give him a video game recommendation, and he can maybe um, relive like the days of Pac Man, except for now he's like fighting robot dinosaurs or something. Like, I'm ready to get him there. We can do this. That's a tech help in and of itself, is if I teach him how to aim in, like, Call of Duty. I think that's a tech help. Corinne, since you devised the question, you must have the good book. Tell us, what is that one good book? I only have good books. But first, I'd like Gabriel to describe the vibe of someone who enjoys cannibalism. (laughs) You said you could just, like, look at them and be like, oh, yeah, their vibe is someone who enjoys cannibalism do they look like virginia yes they do well then three-piece suit (laughs) (laughs) so stepped out of american psycho into the library and that's your okay okay all right fine um yeah, we, we often do get questions, and I, I do remember this as someone, oh, just a good book. And I remember asking a lot of questions, oh, like, what book do you enjoy? Like, what kind of stuff? And they just gave me nothing. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to give you some. And of course, uh, The Gown is the perfect go-to book for that. But I would also recommend um, The Forest of Wool and Steel um, by Natsu me Yashita I know it's not for everyone because it's a very like meditative book about the purpose of life and tuning pianos but it is like so comforting and wonderful and life affirming and yeah I I really really love that book and that is a book that I have just recommended to people that they're like oh I just want a good 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 book and I was like okay take this take this all right Now, because we often give recommendations, we don't always take recommendations, we know that sometimes books hit and sometimes books miss. As Virginia pointed out, like, sometimes you have to ask a lot of questions and you need to make sure that this is the right book for every reader. And sometimes a book is not right for the reader. So I'm going to swing over to Virginia to talk about the book or books that you chose. Oh, Corinne, should we? All right. Okay. So, well, it seems that every single time we do one of these episodes where we have to read a book recommended by a book friend, the forces of keeping fictional always wants me to read a Maggie Steve Edder book. Always. So the last time we did this, I picked Call Down the Hawk um, that is recommended by Fiona because Fiona said it's got murder crabs and that's I, that's all I could think of, even though she keep telling me that there's really not that many of them in there, but like, I just can't help it. So I read that. And this time when we were like putting, like, you know, trying to pick a book from the cauldron, I also got a Maggie Steve Edder book. So I got The Raven Boys and also I got The Wicked and the Divine and both of them. I know because everybody gave me the book. So I know it's from Gabriel. Like they're both from Gabriel. Um, I read both of them. Um, but just because Keep It Fictional wants me to do a magazine battle. So that's why I did. And I have to say, thank goodness I read Call Down the Hawk first. Because if this is the first book that I pick up, I don't think I will ever, ever pick up a magazine battle book ever again. So before I tell you about this book, let's just remind ourselves that our introduction to this podcast does say strong opinions. So here are some strong opinions on our 100 episode. Um, and I'm also going to apologize in advance to Gabriel, to Fiona, who I know both said on this show how much they love this series, especially one of the characters on there, Ronan Lynch. Um, and uh, I know Corinne also gave this four stars. So I am so sorry, my friends. And I am so sorry for any of the words that will come out of my mouth in the next five minutes. And again, just remember that I did read it all. And you know how much I do not like to finish books, but I read it all just for you and just for this podcast. And now I will have to go check out the book called Your Guide to Not Getting Murdered on a Podcast. So um, I, I also feel like maybe in my defense or maybe in the book's defense, how about that, that I feel like this book is very much of its time. It's written in 2012. And I mean, 
that is kind of the type of teen book at that point. I think there was a lot of them that are similar in some ways that are, that was popular in terms of the style, in terms of the premise, in terms of the kind of characters. So I think if I have read it in 2012, maybe I would think differently. But since I don't have a time machine, I can only judge this book with my 2022 self. And this is what you're going to get. So yeah, so I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to like explain this book um, without too many eye rolling. And then I'm going to bring my book friends up a little earlier because it is our hundred episode and it is a time to celebrate books. So I think I'm going to get them to tell you why you should read this series instead of me because I can't and I won't. Um, so yes, the Raven Boys. Who are the Raven Boys? They are the teenagers that go to these ultra elite boarding school for the richest among the richest and it's insane how much tuition costs but it's nothing for them because they are rich and the book and the characters constantly remind us that they are rich and that they are so rich that these kids will never ever have to lift a finger because they have either already or will inherit like a unfathomable size kind of inheritance so they are set for life and for the next hundred lives, probably. And all of them, well, you know what? Okay, fine. It's not a crime to born into a family that is rich. I get it. But treating people in this condescending manner and throwing money at them at any opportunity and thinking that money can solve the problem, that is a choice, a choice made by these Raven boys. So the town don't really like them. Uh, despise them just as much as I do. Um, and they behave and they act like they own everything, which to be fair to them, they probably do own everything. So like who needs to live in a dorm game? You can just buy a whole factory and just make that your home for yourself and the three of your friends. And like, if you did something wrong, get called into the principal's office, that's okay. Just remind the principal, hey, last time my family came to visit, we noticed that your nautical section is kind of like sparse in your library. Why, why don't we build you a new wing, ring, a, a new wing for this? We'll like furnish it, we'll put all the books in it, you have the best collection. So yeah, so just forget about what you just told me and I, you know, I'll, I'll give my dad a call. And you know, if your friend wants to talk to a girl, well, that's okay. Just walk up to them and say like, hey, my friend wants to talk to you. And when the girl said, I'm sorry, I'm working right now because I'm the waitress. Oh, well, you can just ask them, well, how much do you make this hour? Because I will pay you so that you can talk to my friend. That is how they behave. And you know what? We as readers are told, it's okay. Don't like, they, they don't mean it because, you know, like they don't know any better. So it's okay if they treat people like garbage. It's fine. And then on top of all that, given what we have to work with, we have to care about the teen angst. Their whole like, oh no, woe is me. Like their struggles and like, and like they're just arguing with each other. And I don't know why, which I have to say, maybe it is explained in the other rest of the series, why they are the way they are. But I don't think it's in this first book in 400 pages. I don't understand why they would just lash out at whomever when they feel like it. I don't get them. And may, like I said, maybe it will be explained in the next few books, but I will never know because I will never read them. Um, so anyway, four Raven boys that we are going to follow are, I should really get to the story, Gainsey, who is sort of the leader, the, the main plot kind of revolves around him, um, Ronan, whom I'm going to refrain from saying anything because that's a love of like Gabriel's and Fiona's life. So I'm just going to shut up now. Adam, who also kind of um, like who is actually the one who is not like from a rich family. Um, he is actually a scholarship kid. And, and even then, like only it, the scholarship only paid for half of his tuition. He has to work like three jobs to do this. And he hates it when Gainsey like, you know, like throw money at him and, and say, oh, I'll just take care of it for you. But yet, but yet every single time Gainsey does that to anybody else, like he will be the first one to say, oh, it's okay. He doesn't mean it. So I don't understand. And then you're like, well, there's four of them. Yes, there are four. There's Noah, which fine. At some point you realize why he doesn't have any presence at all because you don't even remember him. Um, but that is like quite late in the book that you find out why. So yeah, anyway. Okay, so the main story is that Gainsey is looking for a dead Welsh king from way, way, way back. 
legend has it that, you know, like they are not actually dead. They're just kind of sleeping. So if you can find them, you wake them up, then you will be granted a favor. So that's what Gainsey decided to do. Um, he traveled all around the world because he can and drag his friend around to find the ley lines, which are these like concentrated spiritual energy areas. And they believe that like the king is buried underneath. So they are, while they are driving their beamers around and the Camaro, like all around town, just searching for whatever they feel like because, and you know, who cares about school? Um, get tangled all up in this is another main character, which is Blue. Blue comes from a family of psychics. Uh, her mom is a psychic, her aunts are psychic, everybody's a psychic. And, but she doesn't have that power. She's not one of them. Instead, her power is that she can kind of amplify the energy around her so it makes it clearer and maybe makes it louder for uh, her family of psychics to connect with the spirits um, so she's usually there when um, her family does the readings for clients because she just makes it, things a little easier so when the book opens she is going to some churchyard on St. Mark's Eve so that her family can watch the spirits drift by because whoever that they see are the people that are going to die in the next year and Blue has never been able to see a spirit because she's not a psychic. But this year, she saw a boy. She managed to saw a boy, and the boy actually comes up and talks to her. And he tells her that his name is Gainsey, which, of course, is the other main character. Um, so according to her family, when she tells them about it, like, I actually saw this boy... And they said, well, the two reasons why you can see him either is because he's your true love or because you are responsible for their death. So, of course, now Blue really, really wants to find out what's happened. And, of course, in the back of her mind, she's also thinking about her other curse, which all everybody has always told her, that she if she kisses her true love, then they will die. So, yes. Um, yeah. I, I know. I know one of the things that I know both Fiona and Gabriel have said about this book is that they love the characters. I cannot connect with any of them. I don't understand. So I could care less what happened to them. And I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, and I, and it's all like, and, it, and I'm watching Blue, who is like, trying to like you know like navigate among these four boys who is just like oh like you know I'm so angry that they're treating me badly but yet like I, I just really want them to like me anyway you know and I'm just like okay got away um and and I feel like like the first chapter with blue I'm like okay yeah I can get behind this spirits talking psychic okay fine and then when the Gainsey and his gang shows up I'm just like angry so it's been a very upsetting week and yeah, so I'm just going to get my book friends up so that they can tell you why you should read this book and why I am completely wrong. And I'm totally okay for them to tell me that. So oh, go ahead, Fiona. <laughs> oh, I'm just wondering if Gabriel's going to say the same thing. I won't defend any of the other characters. I do not like Adam. Gansey took me a long time to like, and I don't like Blue. Um, it's all about Ronan. <laughs> Absolutely do not have the same opinions. <laughs> no, it's when I realized that Virginia had chosen my books, I went, oh, no. Oh, no, because I already knew Virginia wasn't going to like it. <laughs> I was, and so in my head, I was just like, oh, no, I've, I've, I've set her up for failure um, because I do legitimately, obviously, very much enjoy the book. But I was like, this is not a Virginia book. This is absolutely in no way. A Virginia book because you have to have a tolerance for for me I think the, the worst part about the series is um honestly like the the romance for a lot of it <laughs> and so for me to know that was one of Virginia's things was like I hate the teen I hate teen romancy angsty stuff I was like oh gosh you have to be able to put that aside to get through this one um I would say that it's it's one of those things that I never, I personally never got the feeling like they were supposed to be excused for their actions. And especially as the series goes on, they do, um, I mean, as is expected with like a teen series, they're, they mature, they have a lot of different, um, they, they sort of start to realize why the things they do um, and did when they were younger is screwed up. You do get their like backstories and things. Whether or not you want to forgive the characters is kind of 
almost like a different conversation because you don't have to and you don't have to continue with it. But especially for me, I think I, I do see the series as a whole. I never had to wait for each book to come out. I just read it as a whole. Um, the first book is probably not the best. I'd actually say the second book is because I like Ronan. <laughs> and the second book is the big Ronan one um, where you you learn a lot of his stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely it's definitely a product of its time. I think it saved it for me because I was willing to kind of get around the romance. I did like them as friends because they reminded me a little bit of my friends <laughs> growing up and the sort of things uh, I guess that you get in a mid-sized Ontario town at private school. <laughs> and so it wasn't super it wasn't super new to me it was one of those things that I was just like this does feel like what happens in grade nine and then you get older um for better or for worse and so I think it's one of those ones where if you could put away certain aspects of it and wait for it to get a little bit wait for it to get a little bit better then it does pay off at least for me um the one thing that I would say I think that really had sold it for me is it does have a little bit of the dark academia going on very like a little bit it's definitely not super, um, it's not super centered around, I'd say like murder in the same way. Like it's, it's definitely a more young adult version of a dark academia thing. Definitely not your Donna Tart, um, but it has a version of that with a, you don't realize this later, but like a murder thing <laughs> and um, a, and a, a private school and the sort of like questionable elitism. I think the, the big thing that it does is it has a lot more focus on characters who don't live in the private school as well, like who, who don't live in that particular universe. Um, and I mean, if you don't like Blue and Adam, then unfortunately, <laughs> then unfortunately you're not necessarily going to enjoy it because they are your window to the rest of the world. But I loved the concept of kids searching for this bizarre, magical, archeological, <laughs> find and just running around town trying to do that because I was like that would be amazing if my if my friend could pick me up in their beamer and I could go and look for Gwit, like Glendower or whatever his name is I'd be sold we're gonna go along the ley line we might end up in another magical world that we don't quite understand where the trees speak Latin you know it's just gonna be a good time it's gonna be a good time and I think for me I don't read a lot of um I don't read a lot of YA fantasy. That's kind of one that I stay away from. So I'm not sure if it's true or not, but to me, it felt really um, inventive. And, and I know Virginia was saying, oh yeah, like all oh, 2012, they're all like that. And like, um, <laughs> but this whole, like I had never heard of a ley line before. So I was like, oh, she invents cool things. No, um, but this whole thing where like, um Ronan's a dreamer and so he dreams things and then they come to life for better or for worse and in the second one there's maybe another dreamer and they spend all this time like like inventing weird things and like thinking like like cars that don't have engines and then like like there's like this engineering aspect to it where they like on one hand they have no limits but they still have to kind of like think around reality um sadly 2012 horrible diversity it's such a like such a white book and then when we do get some diversity they throw those characters under the bus so there is not any excuse for that um um and I'm trying to like hearing Virginia rant I'm trying to remember like what it is that pulled me in because I was so resistant I hated the whole um if you kiss your true love they'll die like I was just like whoa I almost stopped reading it there um and I think it was the second one that really that really pulled me in but even like reading call down the hawk which i think like has also has a lot of issues this like she just like throws things at you that are really unexpected and for me and then she's also one of those writers who plays on suspense a lot um and that keeps you reading and i honestly kind of found the conclusion to this a little bit frustrating because you're like it was it was like a little bit like lost <laughs> where you're like you're like waiting and you're like i can't wait to see the end and then it was very like tepid um but yeah, I even even after like reflecting on all of that, I think this will just stay in my heart as 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 one of my faves. It was it was important to me at an import like a period of time where not a lot of else was going on, and and I just got really really invested in this series. <laughs> 
And that's important. Like to every book, their reader, there are books that Virginia loves that I hate, <laughs> viciously hate. Um, and likewise for any of us, there are our books and it, that's the kind of like the magical thing about a book is that it means things for different people. And so did I deliberately kind of frame this? Cause I knew Virginia had problems <laughs> with her books and I I didn't know it until this morning when I finished it but I loved my book so much I adored it I laughed uh, harder than I've laughed at a book in a really long time um and it might even though um usually we do our top books of the year I think it's going to be one of my top reads of the year but it might not make it on the list because it is um Goodness, it's older than 10 years. Ooh, time flies. Um, so I received two books, one of which I think was from Virginia, which was called uh, Hearts of Oak by Eddie Robertson, which is like a fantasy thing. It said Philip Dick with the calm, smoothing voice of Christopher Priest. And then the other book that I ultimately chose, um, because I set this podcast up as a challenge to myself I only start reading on Thursday when I get home from work and I looked at both of them and I chose the book with the bigger font um, not that either of them were short because I did not have Fiona's luck in getting any novellas I just got straight up novels straight up novels that I challenge myself to read in in one sitting but I am so so glad for this pick um the book that I ended up reading um, was Don Dumont's Nobody Cries at Bingo. And this is a debut from Don Dumont or Don Dumont Walker, uh, who is uh, born and raised on the Okanese First Nation and is of Cree and Métis descent. Uh, and it is her debut. I've heard it both described as like a memoir, autobiographical short stories. I've also seen it described as essays. Um, she was first inspired by David Sedaris, and she writes about her childhood growing up on the Okanese First Nation. And I have to say, this is honestly one of the funniest books I've ever read. <laughs> Um, she writes, uh, she writes so self-depreciatingly about herself as this whiner. She's a whiner. As a kid, she is a whiner. She's always finding something to, to complain. All she wants to do is be loved and petted and celebrated by everyone. And they're always busy doing their own thing, which is very annoying or paying attention to other people. And she is this, uh, as she describes herself like a, a chubby bookish kid um, who desperately wants to be cool and that is never going to happen for her. It is a loving portrait of her, the Dumont family and her mother who is this funny practical bingo obsessed woman um, who has an on again off again relationship with their father who kind of comes in and out of their life at different times he's an alcoholic they have a very tumultuous relationship oftentimes with um, Don's mother taking them in the middle of the night and driving them to another reserve to escape from their father um it is about her cool older sister, Tabitha, who always is so popular and so cool and knows all the right things to say and knows all the right parties and sometimes reluctantly takes Dawn along. It is about the jostling social hierarchy of your slightly younger sister, Celeste, who you have to make sure to keep her in line in the pecking order to make sure she doesn't get too big for her britches, like sitting at the wrong place at the family table to get a little bit closer to dad. Um, about her younger brother, David, who at Tabitha's wedding somehow gets more makeouts than Dawn, even though he is 12 years old and she is desperately looking for a man to make out with because it's a wedding. Um, and her youngest sister, Kathy, who when she's a teenager gets, uh, gets put on trial at a nearby reserve for witchcraft. Like you do. Like you do. Um, it is a book about the importance of bingo, about uh, schoolyard fighting, about going on road trips, 
about that one bad teacher that you desperately want to please, but who will never be good to you. It's about the schoolyard segregation between what she calls like the native kids or the Indian kids and the white kids. And even though it's not explicit, it is still very much there. It's about learning how to drive with a mother who just spends the entire time screaming instructions in your ear. Um, it's about being called... <laughs> You have a bannock belly from your horrible older cousins because there's always a horrible older cousins. It's about having crushes with people in the village only for your mom to be like, oh yeah, they're your cousin. Oh him? Yeah, he's also your cousin until it starts to get a little suspicious that everyone's your cousin. Um, it is a wonderful, heartfelt uh, look into like, a, a beautiful portrait of her as a person, of her as her family, of her as her community. Um, it is a really funny, wonderful book. Um, and I would say if you are looking for like, I say like an indigenous Gilmore Girls by way of David Sedaris, this is the book for you. Um, it is going to surprise you. It is going to kind of like, it is just going to change the way that you look. It is a beautiful family saga. And I'm really looking forward to reading any other books that she writes. If I had to guess, I think this book is from Fiona. Um, and it is a part of our new Indigenous collection, um, and it is very shortly going to be one of Crean's staff picks, so you can look for it on that shelf over there as well. Um, so thank you so much for recommending this one, Fiona. Have you read any other Don Dumont before? Uh, I haven't. So I actually am the one who went with the strategy of put things that are that you've been wanting to read into the pile. Um, yeah, and I just, I've heard her work as amazing and very funny uh, and it's been at the bottom of my TBR for like five years. <laughs> I, I again there's the cabbage sweater incident there's the thrifting when you get the sweater that all, seems good until you take it into the sunlight and you realize it was worn by like a grandma for 85 years and it smells like cats and like old perfume like oh it's so it's so good and because she uh is talking about um Saskatchewan and Manitoba and specifically one of the reserves um just outside of the paw she reminded me so much of my mom <laughs> so much there was like little expressions and stuff like that I'm immediately actually gonna I'm gonna buy this and send this to my mom because I think she'll just get a kick out of it it is so good um so thank you to all of my book friends who were very game for this and apologies to Mark and whatever book he had to read hopefully he enjoyed it I hope um, this has been our 100th episode of Keep It Fictional. And uh, well, here's to 100 more for, from us, to all of our listeners, to all those readers out there. We hope nothing but good books for you. Um, have a wonderful day, everyone. Mm -hmm.